The title of this sermon is Too Hopeless to be Transformed. Now it's one thing to fail and to be transformed from failure. It's another thing to be bad and transformed from being bad. But hope and hopelessness goes deeper. Too hopeless to be transformed. You see, the word hope is a very interesting word. The word hope suggests that the situation in which I am now in, the situation in which I find myself now is not so good, but something better is coming. You follow me? Hope suggests a differential between my present and the future. The opposite of hope is dread. The opposite of hope is dread. And dread also suggests that my present may not be so good, but things are probably going to get worse. Hope suggests that things are going to get better. Dread suggests that things are going to get worse. Unfortunately, I know about dread. It was about 16 years ago, and my dear wife unfortunately had to have open heart surgery. Her mitral valve was all messed up. We had recently gone through a very difficult time, even before we knew that she needed surgery, with a major job change in our, in our household, and uh, we were fairly pinched financially. And then we got this terrible news that she would have to have this open heart surgery, major surgery. Uh, she was put in the hospital, and it was a Saturday night. I lived, we lived in Lincoln, Nebraska at the time. It was a Saturday night. If I recall, it was October 28, 1997. There happened to be that night a terrible snowstorm in Lincoln, Nebraska. Now, you don't usually get bad snows in October, but 13 inches of snow fell on Lincoln, Nebraska that night. It had been a warm fall, and so the trees had not dropped their leaves. The wet snow came and attached to the leaves of the tree, and that night about half the trees in Lincoln were broken by the storm. Thirteen inches of snow paralyzed the city. People lost power, and my wife was in the hospital scheduled to have surgery that following Monday. That very night of that snowstorm, October 28, my 78-year-old father died in California. I received word from my brother. They put off the surgery because the city was paralyzed by the snowstorm. They put off the surgery for a week. My father's surgery, my father's funeral was that, that Friday after October 28, so probably somewhere around November 2. I flew out to California with my son for the funeral, attended my father's funeral, flew back to Lincoln, Nebraska, Saturday or Sunday night, and my wife had her surgery on Tuesday. Now that was the day of dread. I went to the hospital. I had good trust in this surgeon. He was a good surgeon. And he told me, we prayed together with him and with my wife and everything, getting ready for the surgery. He said the surgery would start at 8, and I would see him about noon. My daughter came with me to the uh, to the hospital, we were in the waiting room. My son didn't even come to the hospital. He does not like hospitals to this day. And we were waiting in the, uh, the waiting room for the surgeon and for the people to let us know what had happened in the surgery. Um, they would come out from time to time and tell us how the surgery was going. A nurse would come and tell us. Well, noon came and left, and I hadn't seen the surgeon. And one o'clock came, and two o'clock came. And somewhere between one and two o'clock, even though the nurse came out and said, everything's going okay, everything's going all right, dread, like a heavy stone, started to weigh in my heart. Something terrible must be happening in there. Well, I'm thankful to say that my dread was unfounded. 
The surgeon was simply taking his time to do a very careful job. Uh, if you go in a very quiet room with my wife today, you can hear her tick like a clock. She has a metal valve, St. Jude's heart valve, and it, it clicks like a clock. I didn't see the surgeon until 3.30 that afternoon because he had taken such a long time and careful time to do his surgery. But I know what dread is. It's the opposite of hope, and it's a terrible fog and a terrible heavy weight on the heart. Open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 5. We've got to move right along here in this message this morning. Mark chapter 5. There are two stories in Mark chapter 5. In some ways you could say there are three, but there are two stories in Mark chapter 5, which is unusual for the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Their stories tend to be short. These stories are a little bit longer in Mark. And in fact, the story that we're going to look at today, Mark has the longest telling of this story of any of the gospels. Mark chapter 5. Oh, let's uh, get our, our message back up there, Jairus and Jesus. Okay, there we go. Now, is this little th- clicker that I have going to work? Okay, Mark 5, there you see. That tells you what, uh, let me see if this is going to work. Oh, look at that. I can, I have the power now. Amen. Okay. All right. Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 24 is where we're going to start this morning. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, and on seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. Wherever Jesus was, there was a crowd. He was a great preacher, he was a great healer, and people came to see him. It says that one of the synagogue rulers approached Jesus. These people were not the friends of Jesus. They were typically his enemies, his opponents in any of the kinds of arguments. But Jairus seems to have a different purpose in mind. It says he came and he fell at Jesus' feet. I don't know when is the last time you had somebody fall at your feet. Uh, It's a sign of deep respect, of entreaty, and of pleading. He fell down in front of Jesus. Why had he come? He doesn't hesitate to say why he came. He says, my little daughter is at the point of death. If your daughter were about to die, where would you be? I know where I'd be. Right by her side. Right by her side. Why had Jairus left his daughter when she was about to die. Well, only the greatest emergency or need could draw him away or draw you or me away from our loved one. Jairus reveals why. He says to Jesus, come and lay your hands on her so that she may get well and live. So he has faith that Jesus can heal his daughter. There are two things that drew Jairus to Jesus. His love for his daughter and his conviction that Jesus could solve his problem. Love and faith brought Jairus to Jesus. Jesus goes without a word. He says nothing. Jesus doesn't talk a lot in this story. He says nothing and just starts off with Jairus, would you go with somebody and help somebody who was one of the people who was your enemies? Could you help an enemy? Jesus did. He said, love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Bless those who curse you. And so he showed by his example exactly the way the Christian is to react towards an enemy. If somebody is your enemy, the greatest way to reach them is to help them in their need. You see, when you do that, you will drive them crazy. 
The book of Romans says that you will pour, Proverbs does too, that you will pour coals of fire on their head. Now, some people misunderstand that and they say, oh, you're going to get back at them with those coals of fire. No, 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 no. The coals of fire is the, all, is the guilt that they feel. How can you be so nice to me when I was so mean to you? Hmm. That's because of the love of Jesus in your heart. And it jumps over the wall of their prejudice and they cannot understand. You see, they can disagree with your arguments, but a loving and lovable Christian is an argument that nobody can deny. That's what you and I have to be, loving and lovable Christians, all right? Well, Jesus goes off with him, and the story suddenly shifts. We're now, let's look at our next slide. Do I just push the button and we go back to the slides? No, I don't have the power, you see. Woody's got all the power back there, okay? Oh, oh we, got to, we missed it. Ah, I didn't put the next verses in here. All right. Well, I, I forgot the slide. I was doing these quickly this morning. Mark 5, verses, starting in verse 25. Okay? Mark 5, verse 25. A woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse, after hearing about Jesus... She came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. No. This is one of those sandwich stories I think I mentioned to you before when we studied Peter's story about his denial. It was a sandwich story. This is a sandwich story. If you weren't here be when we talked about that, a sandwich story in the Gospel of Mark is two stories where one story interrupts the other one. Jairus' story is the, the outside pieces of the sandwich, the two pieces of bread, and the woman's story is the center part of the sandwich, the, uh, the lettuce and tomato. Okay? So her story interrupts Jairus' story. Jairus is on tiptoes, wondering what's going to happen to his daughter, when suddenly along comes this woman. All right? Jesus is being pressed by the crowd. The word pressed by the crowd here is an interesting one. It, it was a word that used when you squeezed grapes. I don't know if you've ever been in a crowd where you felt like you were a squeezed grape, and you ever tried to move in a crowd like that. It's kind of like going like this. You know, you're trying to move forward, and it, you can't go very fast. You're being, everybody is pressing around you. Okay, so Jesus is in this crowd, and there is no mention of Jairus at all in the whole story of this woman. You can imagine how he was feeling. It was like you were in a hurry to get someplace, and you pulled out, and, and just as you were starting off and starting to go up, you wouldn't go over the speed limit now, would you? And you were starting to drive off, and you wanted to really get there quickly, when suddenly, off from a side road, comes somebody who is in no hurry at all, and, um, and the speed limit is uh, 80, and they're going 40. And there's no opportunity for you to go around them, and they're just driving slowly and carefully down the road, and you are so tempted to hit that horn, you know. Why is it whenever you're in a hurry that somebody slow gets in front of you? I'll tell you why it is. It's because you're always in a hurry. You need to slow down. So Jairus is, is just wringing his hands, but Jesus can't go very fast anyways, and here is this woman. And the story starts off talking about this woman, a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years. And let me tell you, if you meet somebody and you say to them, oh, how are you? And they say, I'm glad you asked. It started 20 years ago. You're like, oh, I'm sorry I asked. Because <laughs> now they're going to tell you their whole story, okay? Twelve years this woman has been suffering. Now, I want to describe here a little bit about what her situation was like. Uh, it says she had a flow of blood. We're not told where this flow of blood was. It could have been that she had some hemorrhagic disease. It could have been that she had uterine bleeding. And if that was the case, uh, blood would make a person unclean. All right, now we'll go back to the slide there, if Woody will give us that slide back. All right, we'll look at these two Bible verses real quick, Leviticus 15, verse 25, and Leviticus 20, verse 18. All right, you just take a look at these. 
All right, and you get a get a little idea of what ritual uncleanness in Jesus' day meant. Okay, Leviticus chapter 15 and verse 25. Here's what it says. Now, if a woman has a discharge of her blood many days, not at the period of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond that period, all the days of her impure discharge, she shall continue as though in her menstrual impurity she is unclean. Leviticus 20, verse 18. Leviticus 20, verse 18. And it says, If there is a man who lies with a menstruous woman and uncovers her nakedness, he has laid bare her flow, and she has exposed the flow of her blood, both of them shall be cut off from among their people. All right. Now, so what is the situation of this woman with her flow of blood? She is unclean, so she cannot participate in the sanctuary service. Twelve years. 12 years. This woman has been unclean. Uh, not only has she been unclean, let's see the next slide, uh, Woody. I think that I made a little list here of the woman's situation. Okay. The next slide goes like this. She has a flow of blood, so she is likely unclean. She has no name. There's not even mentioned what her name is. Her money is gone. She's gone to all the doctors. Uh, if you spent your money and you got better, that'd be one thing but she's not gotten any better. She's likely divorced because uh, being unclean, she couldn't have relations with her husband and he might have let her go. She's poor, alone, and weak. You say, how do you know she's weak? If you've been bleeding for 12 years, your hemoglobin is low. Normal hemoglobin will be like, for a woman, 12 to 14 um, parts per deciliter. And uh, for this woman, maybe, who knows, maybe it was down to seven or eight and you feel very weak. Her case was hopeless. She knew of no way to get any better. But then it says in the text here that she heard about Jesus. She heard about Jesus. But somehow she doesn't have the opportunity to talk to him. You read Desire of Ages, it's interesting. It says that Jesus recognized that this woman was there in the crowd. And uh, he claimed close to where she was. And she had no opportunity to talk to him. But she reaches out and just barely touches the hem of his garment. Just barely touches the hem of, the, of his garment. And in that moment, all of her faith is focused that she believes that she will be made well if she can just touch his clothes. Now, we read the next verses. Let's go back to the slides here again. All right. And the next one is verses 29 to 34. We'll read what happened to this woman. Immediately the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Her case was hopeless. And then she met Jesus. Her case was hopeless. And then she met Jesus. Twelve years of suffering... Can you imagine the questions that went through her mind during that time? Someone here may have gone through many years of suffering. And the big question that happens to us when anything goes wrong like this is, why did this happen to me? Lord, where are you? What's wrong? What did I do wrong? Or maybe you know what you did wrong and you just, you're just discouraged and everything. Twelve years she'd gone through all this trouble and now she reaches in one moment's time. All of her problem is solved, touching the hem of Jesus' garment. Her hemoglobin, now we'll talk on the medical line, her hemoglobin went from seven or eight up to, to, to 14, just like that. Can you imagine what that felt like? It was like electricity went through her body, you know? She now felt she could run a marathon, jump over a tall building to a single bound, you know? <laughs> she just felt incredibly well, instantly. I can imagine her leaning backwards and saying, oh, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done 
for me. And she starts to move back away when suddenly Jesus stops. And Jesus turns around in the crowd and in a voice that could be heard above perhaps the crowd but certainly by any number of people nearby him, he says, who touched my clothes? Now, that is a very strange question. If you were being jostled by a crowd, remember, squeezed like a grape, everybody was around you and you stopped and turned around and you said, who touched my clothes? I can imagine the disciples there, they're saying, oh, Master, that's not the right question to ask. Everybody's touching your clothes, Master. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're dumbfounded. And somebody in the back of the crowd is going to say, what's he saying, what's he saying? He wants to know who touched his clothes. You know, it's very strange. What, that question suggests that he doesn't want people to touch his clothes. You know, back away from me. I don't want to touch you people. Make path for me. It sounds so untypical of Jesus. It is a very strange question that calls forth from his disciples a most amazed look. Master, everybody's touching you. Why do you ask who touched my clothes? I'll tell you what, there was one person in that crowd who knew exactly what he was asking. And when he asked that question, and he continued to ask, and he continued to look around for who it was, something happened in her heart. Go to the next slide here. I want to show you this a little bit. The roller coaster. You ever been on a roller coaster? Well, some of us have gotten victory over that. We, <laughs> we don't go over on those roller coasters anymore. They did enough to our stomachs when we were 20, you know. <laughs> but some people, they just love the roller coaster, up and down, and oh, you know how you feel. Okay, well, 12 years she'd been in trouble. Where was she then? She was at the bottom of the roller coaster ride. But then along came Jesus, and in one touch, she was up on top of the on top of the mountain again. You know, she was way up on top. But then Jesus asked the question, who touched my clothes? And the Bible says here that this woman had fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. She comes to him shaking. You say, why was she shaking? I'll tell you exactly why she was shaking. Because she hadn't asked him. She hadn't asked him. She had presumptuously reached out and touched his clothes, and she had been healed, and now she was afraid that he was angry. Could you imagine the thoughts that went through her mind? Oh no, he's upset that I have, I have stolen the power. Is he going to take it back? You say, oh, she wouldn't feel that way. Remember, she's fear and trembling. She comes before Jesus. Someone says, why did Jesus do that to her? Why did he let her be on the roller coaster? My wife gets after me sometimes when we go to a restaurant and I want to, I wanna, you know, give a, a nice tip to the uh, waitress or the waiter and, um, and they've done a good job. And sometimes I'll say, I like to talk to the manager of the restaurant. <laughs> and my wife, she always wants to cut in there and she, she says, no, but you should just say, and I'm going to say nice things about you. <laughs> I'm just following Jesus' example. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I listen to my wife. Gentlemen, you should listen to your wife. Amen? Oh, is that the ladies who said amen? <laughs> you should listen to your wife. They have lots of good counsel for you. They have lots of wisdom. But I'll ask to talk to, them, to the manager sometimes and I'll say, you know, this, uh, this waitress, this waiter did a wonderful job tonight. They were just so attentive, they were so caring and everything. I, I would appreciate it if you would put a little note in their file indicating that how much I appreciate what they've done. You know, if you do that, you're gonna make that waiter or that waitress's day. Let me tell you, you're gonna make their day. And you're probably not only gonna make their day, you're gonna make their month or their year because we do not say thank you enough. Amen. We do not say thank you enough. Just look for somebody that you can say thankful to and you can lift them up. Well, why did Jesus put this woman on the spot? 
She comes to Jesus, and it says that she tells the whole truth. The whole truth. Here's the next thing you see. He wanted to give her the benediction of peace. Notice his words. They are in verse 34. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. He, didn't, he wasn't angry with her. He was happy with her because of her faith. And he wanted to give her this benediction of hope and of grace in her life. She never forgot those words, I'm sure. She never forgot that experience. And please notice, everybody was touching Jesus, but only one was touching him with faith. There are thousands and millions in our world today that come and jostle against Jesus. They meet him somewhere in the way, but they never touch him with faith. And they pass by, and it means nothing to them. But if you and I will reach out and touch him with faith, our lives will be healed in ways that other people cannot understand because they don't have faith. The power of Jesus is as real today as it was when he walked here on earth. The problem is, are we willing to touch him? Are we willing to put our trust in him? Are we willing to say, if I just touch his clothes, I'm sure I'll get well? What an amazing story. You say, well, what happened to Jairus? Ah, Jairus is waiting in the, he's wringing his hands. You know, when Jesus said, who touched my clothes? I imagine he was thinking, who touched your clothes? Who cares who touched your clothes? Let them touch it as much as they want. Let's go. Please hurry. If you read the story of this woman carefully, you will see that when she touches Jesus, if you count that as the first reference to the miracle, by the time her story ends, that miracle has been referred to 12 times in just those few verses. 12 times. Somebody says, I don't believe it. Show it to me. Okay, take a look here. You're in verse 26, 27. She came up in the crowd and she touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had proceeded from him, had gone forth, turned around on the ground and said, Who touched my garments? The disciples said, You see the crowd pressing in on you, say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. You could count it as 13 times, 12 times, many, many times. Why is this repeated over and over and over again? I'll tell you why. Because it slows the story down. And it heightens the tension about Jairus' story. And we come to verse 35. Let's take our, do our next slide here. Mark 5, verse 35. Here is the worst verse. This is the worst verse of dread. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? Boy, that's the worst thing that you could hear. Your daughter has died. Talk about the death of hope. Hope is gone. Why trouble the teacher anymore? Death is a barrier you can't go past. There's no more hope. In fact, if you think about this for a moment, and if you were a nurse and people came into the emergency room, emergency department, and you had two cases in front of you, somebody said, okay, explain your case. I've been bleeding for 12 years. Oh, well, how much blood? A little bit here, but I've been bleeding for 12 years, okay? You, what about you? What's your problem? I brought my daughter with me. She's about to die. Which would you treat first? We call the case of the woman with bleeding for 12 years, we call it a chronic case, right? It's been going on and on and on, on and on and on. Is she going to die tomorrow? Probably not. Is she going to die next month? Probably not. Little girl, when's she going to die? Just a few minutes. We call that an acute case. 
A chronic case and acute case. You bring them into the emergency department, it's obvious which one you treat first. The acute case. Which one did Jesus treat first? The chronic case. Whoops. Doctor didn't do the right procedure. Treating the wrong case first. Hmm, very strange. I, I used to teach this to the... Uh, physician assistant students at, at, at Union College, and I, I had a thing they filled out, and I had a little uh, interesting kind of question I would put there. Um, Should you always do what Jesus did? I said, you better not when you're in the emergency room. You better not do what Jesus did, or you're going to get in big trouble. Jesus can do things that you can't do unless you're empowered by him with the miracle of healing. And here he was, and uh, the faithful words come to him, in fact, the same word is used in the Greek text, daughter. Jesus had just said to the woman with the hemorrhage, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. It's the mountaintop. It's the joy. And then the next words are from the people who came from Jairus' house, and they say, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? This is life meeting death. In fact, it's worse than that. The irony of this story is the little girl died because Jesus took too long, too long, healing the woman with the hemorrhage. Too long with the chronic case and the acute case died. What kind of a Messiah is this? He says funny things like, who touched my clothes? He lets the acute case die while he's delaying over the chronic case? What kind of a man is this? This is the type of question that the story raises. Okay, let's go to our next slide. Mark 5, verse 36. But Jesus, overhearing what had been spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid, only believe. Do not be afraid, only believe. Now, I'll tell you what. If you went into a cancer ward and you said to somebody, Don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be surprised if they're about ready to punch you in the nose because of the trouble and the fear and the problems that they're facing. Why could Jesus say this and get away with it? Because he had just done something miraculous in healing this woman, and Jairus could see that there was power in this man's life that could help people. And when Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe, it seems Jairus must have taken hope. What else could he do? The next words come in the following verses, Mark 5, verses 37 to 40. And we read the following. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him. Jairus' story gets more and more narrow from this point forward. And they come to the house, and everybody is weeping and wailing. I know exactly what it was like. Years ago, when my wife and I were missionaries in Africa, I received a phone call in the middle of the night. Uh, the man who worked for us, a cook, his five-year-old child had died in the hospital, malaria. I was asked to go to the hospital to retrieve the mother and the corpse of the child. There in uh, Malawi, there are very few funeral parlors, and you have to bury the dead usually within 24 hours. Death is a very present and potent and evil force in many homes. So I went to the hospital. My chichewa wasn't very strong, the national language. I couldn't say much to this woman. I came to the hospital, inquired, picked up the mother and her child. She carried this child in her arms, and we went to my Jeep. We got in, and we drove to her village. It was pitch black, just dark. She said nothing. She was like a stone sitting in my Jeep. I just drove along. Here she was holding this dead child. When we arrived at their village, I stopped the Jeep. She opened the door and started to wail at the top of her voice. It was the middle of the night. 
the house, their house was up above on a bank, and when her husband heard her wailing, he began to wail. Then all of the neighbors began to wail. It was so sad, so very sad. I know what was going on in Jairus' house, weeping and wailing. And Jesus comes there, and it bothers him. It bothers him. He goes inside the house, and there's more weeping and wailing. And he says, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him. I don't know if you've ever watched comedy on television, but I imagine here in Australia, they do like they do in the United States. They have this thing they call canned laughter. You know, whenever the jokes must not be good enough, whenever they tell a joke, you are te tempted to laugh, but if you don't start laughing, the, the audience on the television starts to laugh. They laugh at every joke. Laugh, a joke brings laughter, and right on cue, Jesus tells a joke at the funeral. You're not supposed to tell jokes at the funeral. He tells a joke at the funeral, and they all laugh. She's not dead. She's asleep. This is a very strange man. Who touched my clothes? She's not dead. She's asleep. Everybody knows she's dead. So what does he do? He throws them out, pushes them out of the house, slams the door. Now finally it's quiet. Can you imagine the people outside? What is, he pushes us outside the house. Why does he do a thing like that? You know, they're, they're all milling around outside, all upset. It's all become quiet inside the house. Jesus takes the mother and the father, goes into the inner room where the little girl is. And here we read the next part of the text. Mark. Oh. Did I not? Yeah, Mark 40. Mark 5, verses 40 to 43. They began laughing at him, but putting them all out, he took along the child's father and, and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded, and he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this, and he said that something should be given her to eat. What an amazing story. Jesus takes these two people into the place they dread to go, and there lying on the mat is the dead form of this little girl. No breath, no heartbeat, eyes closed, dead. And he takes her hand. Now, in the Jewish custom, if you touch a dead person, you become unclean. The woman was unclean, and she had touched Jesus. That would have made him unclean. But I'll tell you, there's something about Jesus that he doesn't become unclean. You see, in Old Testament kind of uh, patterns, something that's unclean is more powerful than something that's clean. Because if an unclean thing touches a clean thing, it makes it unclean. You see? It's kind of like playing rock, paper, scissors, right? Rock, paper, scissors. And the scissors is more powerful than the paper, but the paper is more powerful than the rock, and the rock is more powerful than the scissors. Well, the unclean will always beat the clean. It's more powerful. But there's something about Jesus that's more powerful than unclean. He was not made unclean by the woman touching him. She was made clean. And he was not made unclean by touching the little girl who was dead because he brought her back to life. Now, what he says to her are Aramaic words, talitha kum. What in the world does that mean? Well, Mark translates it, little girl, I say to you, get up. But there's a little bit more to this. The word talitha is not really little girl. The, the word talitha is little sheep. You know what a little sheep is? It's a lamb. It's a lamb. So this would be a term of endearment that a father might, what well, was like Ian Sweeney last night calling his little girl sweetheart. And it's like I call my 30-year-old daughter Amy girl. You know, she's not a girl anymore, but you know, you know, you think of your children, your daughter is still your baby, isn't she? Amen? Uh-huh. All right. He said, Talitha is like little lamb. Get up. How beautiful. How wonderfully 
endearing, how wonderfully graceful. Jesus brings the little girl back to life. She opens her eyes, and the first face she sees is the smiling face of Jesus. She gets up and walks. It says she's 12 years old. Now, let's see our next slide. If you notice something here is very interesting in this story. This is a story of intertwined tragedies. Here's the woman and the gyrus. I'm sorry, it's a little bit small and tight, but I had a lot to put up here. He has a name. She doesn't. He's male. She's female. He's a synagogue ruler. She's an outcast. He comes up in front of Jesus. She comes up behind. By the way, he sees Jesus and she hears about Jesus. His daughter is 12 years old. That's when the joy started was 12 years ago, but that's when her illness started was 12 years ago. Jairus' story becomes more and more private. Hers becomes more and more public. His is the acute case. Hers is the chronic case. Jesus touched Jairus' daughter, but the daughter touched Jesus. These stories are intertwined in such powerful ways. Uh, it's just uh, unmistakable that there's something going on here uh, to intertwine these stories. Somebody says, well, what's the point of these intertwined stories? Well, Jesus is in touch with you wherever you go. He touches the highest people and the lowest people. He may surprise you in what he says and what he does. You see, when he said, who touched my clothes, everybody around him thought he was crazy. But that question was actually the sign of his power that he had healed this woman. So when something crazy happens in your life, start looking to see if God is somehow in the craziness, if he's somehow there with you even though you are suffering and going through this trouble. He asks strange questions. He makes strange comments. She's not dead. She's asleep. To him, she was asleep. To everybody else, she was dead. You see. He may not do what you expect him to do. He may not do what you expect him to do. His surprises are the hiding of his power. Who touched my clothes? One touched and received power. She is not dead, not to him. Here's the point of the story. There is no case so helpless that Jesus cannot help. There is no case so helpless that Jesus cannot help. Reach out to him today. You can still reach the hem of his garment. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that Jesus is passing by today. We want to reach out with our faith, Lord, and touch him. Feel his power in our life, his joy, his comfort, his healing grace to empower our lives. Help us, Lord, as we go from this camp meeting today, tomorrow, whenever it is that we will leave, that we will not be discouraged, we will not be overcome, but by your grace, we will feel your power in our lives, and that you will use this power to be a blessing to all around us. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.